today. The atmosphere is we've come to worship. Stand with us. Let's worship together. One, two, three, go. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, with streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I found in the desert place, go walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun shining down on me when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering with the rain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to pray. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Oh, my God. 
who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? What can stand against? Our God is greater. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome and power. Our God. Our God. Our God. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand again? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand again?
adore you. Worship Center Praise Team. Thank you so much, Praise Team. And to each of you, whether you're watching online or you're here with us in the sanctuary, we just want to tell you, welcome home. We are delighted that you've chosen to be with us today. And now for some announcements. This Wednesday night, once again, there will be no in-house services. But what you can do is you can catch Pastor Mark on the Facebook page at 6.30 with his midweek Bible study. What an awesome time for you to grow and learn in the Word. And if you're in 6th grade to 12th grade, REACH students will be having worship under the stars. We'll be outside right here at the Faith Worship Center campus, worshiping God together, following the social distance guidelines. So make sure that you're here at 7 p.m. to worship with us. And immediately following today's sermon, at noon on the Faith Kids Group, you can check out what Pastor Chris and his team has in store for all the Faith Kids through today's Faith Kids service. Make sure you check us out online at the-fwc.church for all the happenings and information going on at Faith Worship Center. And finally, I just want to tell everyone, thank you for your awesome giving during this time. And now, sit back, get ready, and let's hear what God has to say through Pastor Mark's sermon. Kathy said, I've been trying to figure out how to shut him up for a long time. <laughs> well, praise God. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord today? Give the Lord some praise in this place. Amen. Amen. It's so good to see all of these beautiful faces out here this morning, and it's so good to have you joining us online today. We're gradually regathering, and uh, our congregation is growing back here on Sunday morning. And I just want to say again what a great job our team is doing getting this worship center ready for you to enter on Sunday morning. I want to tell you, you've never walked into a place any cleaner than you walk into here on Sunday morning at Faith Worship Center. So I want you to be encouraged in that. 
Thank you for being with us online this morning, and thank you for joining us here in the house of the Lord. Great worship this morning. Man, our worship team just did an awesome job. Would you give them a good hand this morning how they lit it up and got us ready to hear the word of the Lord? Before I move on to the message this morning, let me take just a moment here and stop and pause and remind us that tomorrow is Memorial Day. And what is Memorial Day all about? Memorial Day is about remembering those who paid the ultimate sacrifice that you and I can sit here this morning in this place and have the freedom to worship, have the freedom to live our lives as we choose to live them and go about in the freedoms that God has so gloriously blessed us with in this nation. We don't want to ever forget to honor those who served our country. A little later on this year, we'll be honoring our veterans and Veterans Day. And last year, we lined up the front with our veterans. We'll do that again this year. But today, we remember those who paid the ultimate sacrifice, who didn't come home to their families, who didn't come home to their jobs and to even to enjoy the freedoms that you and I enjoy, paid the ultimate price so you and I can have it. And I want, you to, I want to say something this morning to those that are watching online and those that are listening here in this place. We don't ever need to take those freedoms for granted. We don't ever need to become so complacent that we assume those freedoms will always be here with us without us doing anything to help preserve them. As we walk through this very tumultuous last few months, we've seen some things in some areas begin to rise that seem like they want to infringe on those freedoms. But I want to tell you something. God gave us our freedom, and I love our Constitution. I love uh, our Declaration of Independence that says these words, that we've been endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. Government didn't give us those rights. Man didn't give us those rights. They came from God. Amen? And to Him be all the glory. So let's don't ever take it for granted. And I'm hoping as we've walked through this time, we've even been enlightened and, and also awakened to how important our freedoms are and what we must do to make sure we always preserve them. If you're listening this morning online or if you're sitting in this congregation and you have a family member, uh, maybe have been years back, maybe even wars back, or maybe in other conflicts, recent or in the far distant past, that gave their life for this country. Our heart goes out to you. Our hat is off to you. Our prayers are with you. And our thanks with all we have to give is to you and to your family for preserving our freedoms. May we never take it for granted. Can you give the Lord some praise? Amen. Amen. Well, so good again to have you here today. And we're on a, we're on a journey uh, for the last few weeks and again today on a what we're calling a journey to Pentecost. Journey to Pentecost. What we've been doing and what we're going to continue to do this morning is we're looking at the events that took place following the resurrection. The different events that took place during that 40-day period of time from the time of the resurrection that led them up to, or the 40 days that Christ walked on the earth, that led them up to 50 days after Passover to a place called Pentecost. Now next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. And I want to tell you, I am, I, man, I'm just believing the Holy Spirit to do something, of course, today. But also as we remember next Sunday morning, as we go to Acts chapter 2, and we remember and reflect on the promise that Christ made that they would be endued with power from on high, and the purpose for that power would be so that they could carry this gospel message to the far ends of the earth. That was the reason. We find that in Acts 1 verse 8. This morning, and we're going to be talking about that next Sunday. This morning we're going to look at the final event before we get to Pentecost Sunday that happened or the final event we're able to cover that happened between the time of the resurrection and Pentecost. And this morning I want to talk to you for a few moments simply about the ascension. The ascension. We're going to look first in Luke chapter 24, but before we get there, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning, and let's ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts, our minds, and come and do His will today. Heavenly Father, 
We pray this morning that you would anoint this message. Father, I pray for those that are watching online today, God, that the power of the Holy Spirit will come right into their living room or wherever they may be. We ask you to send that anointing into this place today. We felt your presence already today, Lord. And Father, we know that you've anointed us with power from on high to go forth and do your works. Now, as we break the bread of life today, speak to us, Holy Spirit. Give us revelation. Speak to this, your servant, what you would want to be said today, God. And may we hear your word. We ask it in the name of every name, the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. It's just so good to have people in here to hear say amen. Amen. I'm tired of preaching. I was tired of preaching to empty seats, and I was also tired of preaching to the little dummies. I told y'all last Sunday how that my, I think I mentioned this last Sunday, how that our kids team came in and set up all kind of puppets through here and put little signs on the front of them. And I came in here, and there was all these little guys sitting up in here, you know. But then I come in one day and they were laying over and I said, that's bad when the preacher puts the puppets to sleep. Now that's bad. Nevertheless, I hope that don't happen with you today. Luke chapter 24. Read with me if you will. Luke chapter 24 beginning in verse 50. It said, and he led them out as far as Bethany and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Now Christ has walked with his disciples. He has met with them after the resurrection for a period of some 40 days. He's met with them uh, as they were gathered on the, actually the day of his resurrection. He met them by the seaside as we talked about last week, the breakfast at sea. He walked with the two men on the road to Emmaus. All of these different things at times he met with them. But remember, as I shared with you last week, his entire purpose for meeting with them was to make sure they were ready for an event that was going to come. That's why I've called this the journey to Pentecost, because Christ was meeting with them. Last week, we talked about how that he helped Peter to get over his guilt because he needed Peter to be at Pentecost. He needed them to be there. Now, it's come to the end of the time that he is going to be walking with them, and it's time for him to be carried up into heaven. To do what? To take his rightful place at the right hand of God to become an intercessor for me and you. Did you know that Jesus Christ, the Bible says, ever lives to make intercession for the saints of God? In other words, he is at the right hand of God praying for every one of us. Now, that ought to be encouraging today. When you're walking through a difficult time, when you're walking through a valley, when you're walking through a time that it seems like God is not there. And I want to take it, I don't want to ask for a show of hands but I, or, or even comments on Facebook about this, but I know that every person under the sound of my voice, whether here or watching us online, has walked through those times when you just didn't know if God was there or not. Can I tell you, to those times when he's often the closest, it's those times when Jesus Christ is interceding for you. So don't give up. Don't listen to the enemy who says, God has left you. You might as well just give up. No, you grab a hold of the promise of the Word of God. You grab a hold of the truth of the Word of the Word of God. You hold on to what Christ said. I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Look the devil in the face and say, I may be going through a hard time. I may be walking through a valley, valley, but the creator of the universe is praying for me by name. <laughs> because he knows my name. Amen. He even knows how many hairs are on my head. Now, some of you said here, keep him busy with that one. But nevertheless, he knows and he cares. In verse 49 of this same chapter in Luke, Christ reminds them again why they need to be in Jerusalem to wait for the promise. Listen so to what he says in verse 49. He says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. 
The last thing Jesus tells them before he ascends is the thing he's been telling them now for 40 days. Go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise. Why is that? Why was it important for them to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise? Because they were going to be unable to do anything he's commanded them to do without the power of the Holy Spirit. Neither can we. Do you know why that we seemingly don't have more success in some areas in our work in the kingdom than we do? It's because often we try to do it in our own strength. We try to do it in our own abilities. We've learned how to do it so well, we often in our minds, we may not say it with our mouth, but sometimes in our heart we'll say, we'll actually in a way indicate, God, I really don't need you anymore. I know how to do this on my own. But I want to take you something. We will never accomplish anything of success for the kingdom unless the power of the Holy Spirit rests upon it. It's by His power and might that we can accomplish anything. And Jesus knew that if they took off trying to do the things He told them to do without the Holy Spirit anointing on their life, they would fall flat. And so will we. Church, if you don't get any other principle this morning, get that one. Every time, and I'm saying this to give glory to God, not pin flowers on me, but every time I sit down to prepare something to share here on Sunday morning, whether I'm my study at home or whether I'm at my dining room table or whether I'm at my favorite office, McDonald's, wherever I may be, I never cease to say, Holy Spirit, come into this time of preparation. And I don't have to beg, plead, cry, spend three hours. All I've got to do is invite Him. He's already there. He's already there. He's already with me. I just invite Him in the process. Simple. And never, never, never does he fail to begin to come and prompt my mind. Sometimes I may start with a thought and it may start here and end up way over here. (laughs) But never does he fail. And I want to tell you something. Never will he fail you if you'll welcome him into the process. He won't. Do you get up every day and welcome the Holy Spirit into your day? If you don't, you should. Now, when I say welcome Him, understand, He's already there. (laughs) You don't have to ask Him to come. He's there if, if He's in you. But it's simply opening your heart and saying, Guide my steps today. Direct my path today. Show me what I need to do today. Give me wisdom today beyond my ability. Help me, God, that I have divine appointments today. Holy Spirit, if you give me that divine appointment, give me the wisdom today to know what to say and how to handle it. It's simply inviting Him in the process. He's already there. It's just inviting Him in the process. Now, in Acts 1, verse 4, let me, let me also point out here to you. Acts is literally a continuation of the gospel of Luke. Luke wrote both Luke and Acts. You can almost, the, the Acts is even considered sometimes as a companion book to the book of Luke. We know this by a couple of simple things. Number one, by who Luke addresses his books to. He addresses the Gospel of Luke to Theophilus. He addresses Acts to Theophilus as well and makes mention of the former writing that he sent to him. But he also includes some things as he opens the book of Acts that he had closed the book of Luke with. You could almost put these two books together. They were a continuation of one another. And in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, we see here that Luke in his writing the book of Acts, repeats the command that was given as he closed his writing of the book of Luke. And here's what it says. It says, being assembled together, being assembled together, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you've heard of me. 
Why is it that Luke felt it important to restate this? Now he's already stated it in, in his writing of the Gospel of Luke in one time. But now as he's writing the book of Acts to Theophilus, he restates again what Jesus said about go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. Because Luke understood the importance. He understood the importance of this command of Christ that they go there and wait. He restates it because he knew they needed to be reminded that Christ had said, you must go and wait for the Holy Spirit. Folks, I cannot impress enough upon us this morning how important the Holy Spirit is. And do you understand he is a person? He's not an it or a thing. He's a person. Do you understand he is the presence of God in this world? God's on the throne. Christ is at the right hand of the Father. He has sent the Holy Spirit back here. And if you make any contact with God or get anything from God, you're going to get it through the Holy Spirit. He's the empowerment in our lives. Well, not only does Luke restate this in his book, but also going down to verse 9, he also restates the ascension. Now I'm kind of getting down to what I really want us to think about this morning for just a few minutes. In verse 9, he starts this way. It says, now when he had spoken these things, he's, restated, he's already stated the ascension in, in the end of his in the, in the end of his gospel. Now he's restating it again about this event that took place when Jesus took them out on a mountain and literally was carried away in their presence. He said, now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, the things, of course, which he had spoken was reminding them to go to Jerusalem, wait on the Holy Spirit. He was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, now hold on a minute. Luke now includes something in his account of the ascension in the book of Acts that he doesn't tell us in the gospel of Luke. Neither does any of the other gospel writers tell us. He includes a little more of the story of what happened on that mountain as Jesus was carried up. In this account in the book of Acts, a little more than what he said before. He talks now about two men who stood by them in white apparel as they're looking up into heaven. As Jesus has been carried away in the cloud, he's been carried away up into heaven. And these two, and they're just standing there gazing at the cloud. Jesus is gone. He's out of sight. But they just keep looking at the cloud. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to Jerusalem. So how many of you ever been to Israel? I've been three times, thank God. But I want to tell you, they build a temple on top of everything. Any site that has anything to do with any kind of holy site, they build a temple on top of it. There's a temple of Beatitudes. There's the uh, uh, Nativity, the, temple of the, of the, the church of the Nativity. There's the church of the Holy Sepulchre. I mean, uh, there's a... Uh, there's a, a, a building on Mount Carmel. And, I mean, everywhere they build something on top of everything that is some kind of holy site. This is why, this is why I've always believed that Jesus, that God buried Moses. Nobody knew where he buried him. Why? If they had have buried Moses, they'd have built a temple on there, and they never would have got to the promised land. Amen. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt if Ed had stood there gazing long enough, somebody would have come up with a bright idea. Let's build a temple of the ascension. That's where they would have stayed. Guys, we've got to be careful building our lives around one experience, around one thing. We've got to build our lives around what God is doing. Amen? There's nothing wrong with reminiscing about the past, but there is something wrong with living there. Amen? past is gone. It, it, you can't bring it back. Let's see what God has in the future. Amen? Glory to God. I can't relive tomorrow, but I can grab a hold of what God wants to do today. Hallelujah. I can build on the things of the past, but I can't live there. The, the things of the past need to be building blocks uh, for, for, for the future. Moving ahead in what God has. <laughs> let, let me share this. Let me, let me just take a rabbit trail here. 
You know, two weeks ago we had the National Day of Prayer. The National Day of Prayer. It was a great event. I'm going to tell you something. We had more people join in on the National Day of Prayer this year. That, you know, I, I know the devil gets fighting mad when he thinks he does something and God just turns it around and slaps him all over the place with it. We had more people engaging in the National Day of Prayer across this nation than has ever, ever, ever engaged. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. There was a prayer on a mountain in North Carolina, right above Charlotte, North Carolina. There was a prayer on a mountain there. And this is all coming impromptu, so I may not have the numbers exactly right. But there was a 90-year-old man that God spoke to. He said, God, what can I do? I'm 90 years old. I'm not talking about a Moses now. Somebody, I know we talk about Moses when being 80, and we say, oh, well, that was a different thing back then. No, this is a current-day man who's 90. God said, I want you to hold a prayer on the mountain. He was going after 100,000 people. Then coronavirus hits. Do you know that they had a prayer on that mountain on the National Day of Prayer? And if I'm not wrong, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, and I'll look it up. But if I'm not wrong, there were over a million people who joined in to that prayer from that mountain in North Carolina on the National Day of Prayer. Led by a 90-year-old old man well he should have been retired no he didn't get retired he got refired hallelujah I may be 90 but God can still use me come on church get your calling off of the shelf and start putting it back into action and put it on the shelf when God says it's enough and I call you home but until then there's something to do for Jesus Mm. Mm. Two men stood in white apparel, and here's what they said. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. What were those two men telling them? They were saying, it's time to quit gazing into heaven and get to work. <laughs> Can I say something here without the worry of offending anyone? And if I do so, I'm sorry, but get over it. We're not just, to spo we're not just supposed to stand gazing into heaven. We are to, supposed to be bringing heaven to earth. It's not about just gazing into heaven. It's about letting the kingdom of God live in us so we bring heaven down here. Now let me clarify what I'm saying before somebody says, Pastor said there wasn't no heaven. I didn't say that. We know there's a heaven. We know there's a hope. We know there's a promise. We know there's a place God has for us. But we also know that if we only gaze there, we won't get what He wants us to do done here. If you're going on a journey, if all you ever do is sit and look at your destination, but never map out how you're going to get there, you'll never reach it. <laughs> Heaven is a real place. Heaven is a pray place where all of those who serve God have the hope of one day being carried to when our work is finished. But these men let them know right off of the bat, you're not to stand here. Yes, it was good to be here. Jesus brought you here. But now it's time to quit gazing into heaven and now get about doing what that man you just saw go up has told you to do. If all you do is stand here gazing into heaven, you'll never get to Jerusalem. And you'll sure never carry this gospel message around the world. We know that we're supposed to bring the kingdom to earth. And I'll explain a little more about that in a second. Because Matthew 6 verse 10 has these words to say. 
Jesus, in teaching his disciples to pray, said, Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Somebody said, Pastor, I don't think it's possible to bring the kingdom of God to earth. Well, then you've got to deny what Jesus said, because when Jesus cast the demons out of the young lady, he said, if I cast them out by the prince of devils that they were accusing him of, then who do your sons cast them out by? But if I cast them out by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. You see, when I share the gospel with somebody and they give their life to Christ, guess what? I've just brought a little of heaven down to earth. When I encourage someone that's about to give up, but yet the Holy Spirit instructs me to come alongside them like he did Philip alongside that eunuch in that chariot, and I encourage them, and I pray for them, and I help encourage them in their walk with God, and they continue on with Christ, I have brought a little bit of heaven down to the earth. And I'm a tool in the kingdom of God to lay hands on someone that is sick and pray for them and watch God raise them up. And I'm in a tool to help bring the kingdom of God down here. Because what happens when the kingdom of God comes? It sets things that are out of order in order. You remember in Genesis chapter 1? And the Bible tells us that the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The earth was an inhabitable place. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of why that was. That's a whole other message, a whole other teaching. It takes a long time to do. But nevertheless, based on the writings of Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the earth at that moment was an inhabitable place. It was without form, it was void, and darkness on the face of the deep. And if I understand right, it was covered with water. But listen to what the next verse says. Or I think it's in that same verse, just verse 2. The Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. Somebody said, wait a minute, Pastor, that, the Spirit of God could have been there. That was in the beginning. He wasn't there. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit were together before anything was ever created. They were from the beginning of all time. Amen? And the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that anointed Christ, the same Holy Spirit that must anoint us, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Holy Spirit that's worked miracles throughout the centuries, that same Holy Spirit hovered over the face of the earth. And you know what he was doing? He was hovering over the face of the earth to bring order where there was chaos. Because you see, it's, it's out of the Holy Spirit that God speaks to us. You see, if, when you hear the voice of God in your heart, guess who brought that word to you? The Holy Spirit did. So can you see when the Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the earth, he'd hover? And then like lightning, a word would come forth through him. Boom, let there be light. <laughs> and then another word would come forth. Boom, let the waters of the lands divide. And another word would come forth. Boom, let there come forth the beasts of the field and the fish of the sea and all those things. And as the Holy Spirit hovered and God spoke through him, the earth now became an inhabitable place. Do you get a picture here? Do you get a picture here, church? You know, we... We, the church, sometimes get this idea, well, there's not anything I can do. I can't make a difference. I'll just hang on and hang out until Jesus comes or I go to, be, go to heaven. No, the Holy Spirit wants to rest on you so he can also through you, boom, speak a word. Reach out a hand. Share a message. Lay hands on somebody. So that he can speak through you. So that the Holy Spirit working in our lives can help bring some order to a chaotic world. Can I get an amen in the house somewhere? Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14. He said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. You know, we get that passage a little wrong. We get that passage wrong. We get that passage wrong by saying that the Bible says when, you know, when the gospel's preached in all the world that Jesus will come. That's not what it says. It says when the gospel of the kingdom is preached. 
Do you know that Jesus, Jesus never talked about church order? He never talked about church structure. He never talked about any of those things. He left those things to be dealt with later on that the Holy Spirit would lead them in when they needed it. And they did. We see in the book of Acts how they needed some the guidance there about how to structure things. And the Holy Spirit led them in what to do. Jesus never talked about those things. Do you know the only thing Christ ever talked about? The only thing he ever talked about was the kingdom. The kingdom. The kingdom. The kingdom of God. The power of God. The anointing of God. And he said, when the gospel of the kingdom, not just any gospel, but kingdom gospel. And I want to tell you, if you want to pray for the hurry coming of Jesus Christ, you pray that the kingdom message will, be, will reach the far corners of the earth. The message of the kingdom. The message of salvation through Jesus Christ. The message of deliverance from oppression. The message of victory. That's the kingdom message. You know, the disciples of Christ, the disciples of Christ had a, they had a hard time divorcing themselves from the idea that Jesus did not come to set up an earthly kingdom. They had a hard time with that. I mean, even at the very end, some of them are still struggling with that, okay? Because here, look here, here's a man who can raise people from the dead. Man, he can take five loaves and two fishes, feed a multitude. Wow, couldn't we, couldn't we, we wouldn't have to be depend on anybody. Just bring it to Jesus, let him bless it, and we feed the whole country. Amen. He could walk on water. He could take mud and spit and create a man to brand new eyes. He could take pure, clear water and turn it into the best wine they've ever had. Amen. My goodness, this man could lead our nation back to greatness. This man could lead our nation uh, to, to rise up again and be the superpower. We could once again be the dominant force. We could, he could lead our nation to overcome those oppressive Romans. And we could once again rule. They had a hard time separating their mindset from that. We see that. If you read the Bible carefully, you'll see that. You'll see. I, I'm fully convinced that Judas never was able to get that out of his mind. And the one reason why, because of that deception, the enemy was able to deceive him to betray the very Christ. But you see, Jesus wanted them to know he didn't come to raise up an earthly kingdom to overthrow the Romans. He came to raise up a kingdom that would even change the Romans. <laughs> He didn't come to raise up an earthly kingdom to overthrow any country. He came to raise up a heavenly kingdom that would transform every country. He came to bring a kingdom message that wouldn't just be to one group of people, but would be to every group of people all the way around the world. That everybody, no matter what country they're from, or what nationality they were, or what their race was, or anything, He came not to raise up an earthly kingdom to overthrow other kingdoms. He came to bring down a heavenly kingdom to change every kingdom. It took Him a long time. It took Him a long time ever get their mind wrapped around this idea. Even after Christ left, even after the day of Pentecost, they still were so, in, so in, entrenched in their mindsets. God had to send a vision to Peter and send him down to a Gentile's house and let, she, let him visibly watch the Holy Spirit fall on them and them speak in tongues just like they had on the day of Pentecost before Peter finally said, oh, I get it now. I get it now. This is not just for us. This is for everybody. <laughs> That's the message, the gospel. Guys, to try to come to a close here today. Don't just stand gazing into heaven. Don't just reminisce about what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. If you're bought with the blood of Christ, you're going to get there. And that's our hope. 
That's the reason Christians can often face persecution and even death because they know this world is not their home. That's the reason a saint of God could come to the end of their life and have joy bubbling up inside of them because they know they're fixing to make a transition from one world to a world that where there is no dying and no death. And we know that. That's our promise. But for those of us that are still here walking around on two legs, we got work to do. We got souls to reach in the kingdom. We got a message to preach. So while we do know he ascended, and we know he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, the message to Christ would be, go wait for me at Jerusalem. Be endued with my power and carry this promise of hope of eternal life to as many as you can because I'm coming back again. The same way I left is the same way I'm coming. And my hope is that you will have carried this message as far as you can. This morning, if you're sitting in this place or if you're watching online and you're not sure that you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today is the day. Right now is the time. I'm going to ask everybody in this congregation to stand with me this morning. And I'm going to actually ask this congregation to pray with me today. And I'm going to ask you online to join with me this morning to pray this prayer. And if you're out there and you don't know Jesus Christ, if you'll pray this prayer and you mean it from your heart, Christ will transform you. And if you're in this congregation today and you're not sure that you're saved, and let me remind you that to be 99% sa- uh, be, be, to be 99% sure is to be 100% lost. <laughs> if you're not sure that you know Jesus, right where you are, pray this prayer from your heart. And then when you pray this prayer and God transforms your life, the next step is to make sure you share this with somebody. Tell somebody, because the Bible says, With a heart man believes unto righteousness, with a mouth confession is made to salvation. Congregation, would you pray this with me? Even if you're saved, pray it with me for the sake of that one here that's not and for the sake of those watching online. And just say this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I know you died on the cross. That your death on the cross takes away my sins. Today, Jesus, I ask you, come into my life. Forgive my sins. Wash me. Cleanse me. Today, Christ, I receive you as my Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. If you prayed that prayer today in a minute, God's transformed your life. Now I want to pray for this congregation before we go, for all those watching online before we get off this morning. And I want us to pray one more prayer, and that's the prayer of action. And I want to ask the Lord to bless us and anoint us that as we go forward, we ask the Lord, what is my purpose and plan? What do you want me to do? And whatever path He leads us on, that we make sure we follow that path. So Father, as we close this service today, I thank you for those that prayed that prayer today, Christ. But I thank you also now for the body of Christ, that God, I'm believing you positioning us as we walk through this time to go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit and do greater works than we've ever done. You've opened doors and made ways, God, that we could not have even imagined. So Holy Spirit, anoint us. And God, if we've been doing nothing but gazing into heaven, remind us, Christ, that we've got a work to do here. And the greatest way we honor you is not by gazing into heaven, but by getting about and following your command and doing your work. Now, Father, as we go forth in this place, where we go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and do the works of the kingdom. And I believe in God throughout the course of this next week, you're going to use each of our lives, those here and those watching online, in some way to touch and transform somebody's life and bring heaven to earth. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us today. We praise you and thank you for your presence. God, our steps in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord some praise this morning. God bless you. Thank you for those watching us online this morning. We're glad that you're here. Now, just remain standing with me for a moment. We hope you enjoyed the services today here at Faith Worship Center. We trust that you will log on to the-fwc.church for all the information concerning Faith Worship Center and its upcoming events. You can also give online at the-fwc.church. Simply follow the links.
And before we go, I want to remind you the happening at 12 noon today, Faith Kids Sunday service will go live on their Facebook group. So please go check that out, gather the kids, and be blessed through that. Now we thank you for joining us at Faith Worship Center. We can't wait to see you soon. God bless.